If you want to grow your sales, and who doesn't, you need to get involved with TMSA, Transportation Marketing and Sales Association. TMSA has been around for 100 years because it is a great place for transportation sales and marketing people to learn and grow. TMSA is holding an event called Elevate and it is taking place June 9th, 10th, and 11th in New Orleans. I went to TMSA Elevate last year in Savannah and it was fantastic. The leaders in our space are there and they're sharing what's working for them. Please check the show notes for links to TMSA and TMSA Elevate and I will see you in New Orleans. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is Supply Chain 2030 with my friend Ron Crabtree. Ron is the founder and CEO of MetaOps a global network of operational excellence rock stars ready to tackle your toughest challenges. They'll diagnose your problems and get you back on track fast. Ron and I discuss some of the big operational challenges facing the supply chain over the next five or six years. If you work in logistics and supply chain, please take a listen to my conversation with Ron Crabtree. How's it going, Ron? Going really well, thanks. Ron, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. My name is Ron Crabtree. I'm the president and founder of Meta Ops and Meta Experts, and we're located in your beautiful Kalamazoo, Michigan. Very nice. So, what does Meta Ops and Meta Experts do? Over the years, after 20 years of uh, reinventing ourselves over and over, we've settled in on the Meta Experts top count solution. And think about it as big business problems, need people that can quickly step in on an interim, part or full time basis to just bring the expertise to fix the problems, get it done. That's what the Meta Experts brand is all about. We've had a lot of success with that in recent years. Yeah. And so who do you, what kind of companies do you work with? It's quite a variety, but generally speaking, it's tangible goods oriented organizations, people who make and move stuff. This practical matter, large organizations consume a lot of physical things to do delivery and fulfill on their promises to their customers. But generally speaking, it's people who have to deal with tangible goods. So manufacturing, distribution, wholesaling, retail. Consumer goods, been a big push lately to help support the, I'll call it the medical device industry, and then everything around generating, delivering, and providing power, right? So generating power, storing power, delivering power. There's an amazing amount of stuff that's required for all that to happen. And that's been a, a big area of growth for us because there's a massive uh, shortage of talent. Yep. And Ron, years ago, I, I, I don't know how long ago we met, but I was still at a little 3PL when we met. I remember I could not work with you at that time, uh, but you had a project and I introduced you to my, our friend, Doug Sartain, who's over at Redwood now, great guy. And then years later, you called Doug and said, hey, I need you again. And Doug said, I, I'm busy, call Joe. <laughs> and you did. And I worked with you. Now, the project ended just before COVID, but... We started a project in 2016, and I remember you told me, Joe, will you do an assessment uh, of a logistics operation, and it'll be 80 hours over one month, so 20 hours a week. And I was like, yeah, I can fit that in. I was already doing the logistics of logistics then, and I was like, I can fit that in. And it was a very interesting project, super interesting. And... That ended up going three years. Now, it wasn't full-time three years, but I couldn't do full-time three years. But it put me in a really good position because I was working with a very large shipper, one that spends quite a bit of money. And I got to see the world from the other side. I'm an automotive guy originally. So I came from big companies and I understood what they wanted. But to sell logistics services for a while, be in that side and then move on that side, It was a fantastic opportunity. I made good money. And so I'm a big fan of what you do. And then over time, there was other people plugged in, including our friend Doug, plugged into that project. And I love the model you have because you bring top talent to solve a problem. 
if it's a if it's one month or two months or three months, great. But if it's three years, great. So I still have friends from that project. <laughs> so thank you. I love what you guys do. <laughs> Appreciate that. I know you do all sorts of projects. And again, you mentioned the interim piece. Is that the normal where you plug somebody in for six months, year to solve a problem and then they come out? Or how? What's the, give us a sense for the average program you work on? That's a tough one to answer because there's different reasons why organization can tap into your own talent, right? So there's the episodic stuff, like there's a project to do. For an example that you just gave, we need to really assess what we're doing on our outbound spend on logistics and should we be looking at the 3PL. It's episodic. We're going to do it one time where amateurs are doing that. Why do something as an amateur? Let's get somebody who really knows what they're doing, step in, get that done for us, and then move on. So that could be part-time, that could be full-time. And then there's emergency-based stuff. We had, I, was, I was sitting at home on uh, Good Friday back in 2020. So this is at the onset of the COVID pandemic. And I get this phone call from the president of a privately, private equity organization. He says, hey, man, I got John. He's out in California. He's one of our businesses out there. And he's in San Francisco. He's got this plant in Los Angeles. And They've got, they're back ordered like you wouldn't believe for PPE, personal protective equipment for retail stores. But think about the shields and all that stuff. They had to very quickly figure out and deploy and all these. So they have these massive orders. He said, so we're backed up like you wouldn't believe the site manager who runs that plant in Los Angeles walked up today without notice. We're scheduled to run all weekend. This is Easter weekend. Who do you have in Los Angeles? They could step in there on Saturday, tomorrow morning. Yes. Remember, this is noon on Friday. Who can you have in Los Angeles that has the manufacturing background to step in there and help us make sure these orders get out next week? So John couldn't even get on the plane at that point. So he hops in his car to drive from, from San Francisco to LA. And before he got there, we had three different not expert resources residing in the LA area, that strong manufacturing background. And he was good to go on Saturday morning before it got So that's an emergency-based thing of, We've got something just plain got to get done, and we need somebody with experience. From that particular case, somebody local is important because you know, you're going to want to fly somebody here and have to deal with all that. And then the third scenario is I'll call it more of that contract hire type situation. There's a hole in your chart. We really need somebody to fill this spot, run the purchasing department, run our supply chain group, step in and help run the manufacturing operations or whatever. But I'm not sure it's a permanent job, right? So I want to get somebody started to get this stuff done. Or, you know what? I can't wait three to six months for a typical hiring cycle. Let's get somebody in our contracting basis just to get the work done. And then later, we like them, they like us. We do a deal and cut them over to be hired. So we do get involved with filling permanent roles. That's usually adjunct to something that's more episodic or more emergency-based so that needs to be handled. But we do support customers we're filling critical roles uh, as well this that is such what you the last one is so normal now where people start as a contractor whatever you want to call it contractor consultant interim whatever you want to call it you jump in you say i can get somebody right away and maybe they're maybe it's a great fit for both sides and you say we'd like to keep it but maybe it's just you filled a, a hole for a while you looked and maybe the person's not interested in your organization but that's so normal today Ron, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Some career highlights before you started Meta Ops and Meta Experts. And also, please answer why you started the company way back when. I grew up here in uh, the Kalamazoo, Michigan area and ended up moving to Los Angeles back in 1978. And uh, we were out in California for about four years and uh, got a chance to work for this little company called Disney. In their manufacturing division, and got hired in as a production scheduler in their plastics and mechanical manufacturing, it's where they were designed and made all the audio animatronics and the animated figures you see in the Disney theme park, and then the, the ride the vehicles, the ride control systems, etc. And then at the same time, they were uh, moving down the path of integrated program evaluation and review technique, PERT, for project management purposes on computers. Back in 1979, I think it was at that point. And so I was uh, at the right time as they were ramping up to build the Upcom theme park project that opened in 1982. 
They tackled the Tokyo Disneyland project at the same time. So they had all the stuff they had to make, but very small amount of resources available that they have the expertise required to make all that stuff. We were using PERT and other tools to basically capacity constrain your planning of manufacturing and making everything go into the show and ride for those facilities. And I was very fortunate young man at that point. I catch the way he sent out for a bunch of participant project management training or what have you. Instead of going to college, part-time, I didn't go to college right out of high school. I went into the factory and started working. Here. And then we moved back to Michigan. We got involved with uh, the automotive supply chain, the materials management and operations. I continued to go to night school. I ended up working for United Technologies Automotive, materials management, one of their plants down in Indiana. And I got moved to Metro Detroit back in 96 with UTA to work in corporate purchasing. And we were doing some pretty cool stuff around Target and Kaizen costing and supplier rationalization programs and stuff like that. We had a guy running that group that came out of Toyota and some folks now. And another gentleman, Herb Jordan, who's now a senior guy at Ford in procurement. Got to learn a lot about that. And ultimately, we ended up finishing up an undergrad in management organization development back in 1997. And then moved into consulting. I started out at Grant Thornton, which is a large tax and auto organization, global organization, working in their continuous improvement practice. Because I'd learned a lot about lean techniques, a lot about supply chain, a lot of the way. And Ended up being an Oracle practice leader and leading large-scale Oracle implementations out of the Detroit office. And, and then I had a stint working for a large consulting company doing lean manufacturing consulting, RWD Technologies at the time. And uh, I think at the time, the world's largest group. Of I remember those guys, yeah. And uh, a lot of ex-Toyota folks. So I ended up uh, being blessed to work on a very large project at Ford Motor Company around their accelerated lean deployment program. And we were doing some pretty intensive I'll call it Toyota-based metrics breakdown in assembly plans, taking a look at SQDCMP metrics, safety, quality, delivery, cost, productivity, morale, down at the workstation level, and determining what was possible through advanced application of lean at Ford plants, which was a great experience. And from there started my company, MetaOps, Meta Experts, back in, when it incorporated in 2002, initially as a management consulting company of lean six sigma supply chain. I became very active in thought leadership. I traveled the country presenting at various organizations around how do we apply this stuff in supply chain and operations, helped develop Lean Six Sigma online programs under the Villanova brand back in the mid-2000s, early 2004, 5, 6 timeframe, and worked with a number of organizations around developing their center of excellence and thought leadership around learning and applying best practices in the supply chain, including developing at one time I helped develop about 32 weeks of online training in supply chain and lean supply chain for University of San Francisco under the University Alliance program. So lots and lots of experiences there. And about to back in 2011, 2012, we created the Meta Experts brand because of customer requests. They were saying, look, not looking for a consulting gig. I really just need somebody I can borrow and put them to work just to get this stuff done, the side kind of stuff and project-based support. We realized there was an unmet need in the marketplace for super talented people that could step in on not management consulting and not hiring them outright, but something in between, right? An interim solution, both part and full time. So that's where Meta Experts was born. And we developed an extremely rigorous 300 point vetting process. People go through to get inside the firewall to be certified Meta Experts. Uh, these are all independents. There's three buckets to our Meta Expert community. There's the, the graybeards, right? Some are retired. They don't want to relocate. They don't want to work for the man. But they don't want to pick up gigs, right? Those part-time gigs and short-term, shorter-term projects don't have to relocate. The second big bucket would be the in-betweeners. These are mature professionals that are looking at contracting, maybe as a bridge until they land in that next full-time role. It's really the long-term thing for the rest of their career. And the last third would be the pure gig economy types. These are the folks that are perfectly okay with the ambiguity, working from project to project. They might work with two or three customers at the same time on a part-time basis to keep themselves going. So we have a large number of them. And we're now uh, approaching 1,100 certified meta experts in uh, almost all U.S. states and 26 countries. We're also part of an international consortium of similar firms, IXPA, I'm actually the chair this year. So we have the ability through our partner network to support our customers just about any country in the world 
with internal talent that can step in and get stuff done. Yeah, I love it. Ron, when I was working with you, I had just started. So I started the logistics of logistics. I was doing some digital marketing and I remember thinking, okay, this is what I want to do. And then I had also started the podcast, but I was not making the kind of money I needed to make. And also I wasn't desperate for projects. So the, the thing is, it had to be something that was interesting to me also. And what you brought to me was very interesting and it fit. So I will also say there's a lot of small consultant consulting businesses. I know guys who will end up working with you because you guys have a lot of work and they say, Hey, I'm just starting whatever I'm doing, but I we will get to this more as we talk. We're going to talk about labor in a minute. Yep. We are already at the place where the average baby boomer is past retirement. The average baby boomer is past retirement. I'm one of the younger baby boomers. A lot of them are going to stick around. I know you're going to stick around for a while, Ron, and I'm going to stick around for a while, but they want something different. But we also are seeing so much I want to send to low cost countries. We're going to send that work to low cost countries, which is great. Big believer in that. I've always worked with Lean Solutions Group down in Columbia. Great companies are doing that. Almost every transportation logistics company I talk to says, oh, we are our partner for that. The challenge I think we have is sometimes that is younger groups that ne don't necessarily have expertise that can set the direction. They can certainly follow the direction. They can execute. But I think there's some going to be some advantages. Say, yeah, I got a guy who's been there, done that already, done that project four times. Let him lead a little bit. He doesn't want to do the execution stuff. He doesn't want to do the stuff he did 10 times in his career. So I think we're going to start seeing a marrying of the, the kind of talent that you're bringing with meta ops and meta experts and some of the overseas stuff. Not going to surprise me. Brave, brave new world, Ron. So today's topic is supply chain 2030. So I was talking to you yesterday or the day before, and we were talking about different topics and we came, you, you were, you've been Ron creates a ton of content. I will direct you to his website and to his podcast, but meta, meta pod series. But one of the things that has been kind of a common theme over at meta ops is three, three broad areas of where the supply chain is going in 20, 2030. So I want to talk about each of those three things. So the first one was digitization and automation, including AI. Please elaborate. I've got something to say about it, an opinion. Are you hearing me okay, Jeff? Yes. So once that happens, or one of our uh, global global customers, they happen to be a large e-learning company, and they provide corporate solutions for uh, learning and development for large companies around the world. And they came to me uh, back in 2020 and said, look, we need an all-new digital transformation awareness program. And we wanted, they just wanted a fresh start, right? Just kind of take a look at really the state of the art and what's possible. And the backstory took that on, and they brought in a team of meta experts. These are people I've known and built development developed relationships over the years, each of which brought specific technical expertise in certain aspects of digitization. And we took a look at what's out there from a digitization and a transformation of work perspective. Now, remember, this is four years ago now, right? So it's a little dated already. And we came up with more than almost 30 different buckets of digital transformation content that organizations need to be aware of. Artificial intelligence, for example, is really big in the news, right? Everything is talking about AI or what are we going to do to be on the bandwagon? And there's truth to that, but I would warn you that it's not that simple. And uh, AI is just one of many things. So I've got my list here of goodies. And from a digital transformation perspective, organizations all share this common problem that, A, it's really hard to understand, it's very hard to apply. It looks like the silver bullet cure or artificial intelligence being, okay, yeah, we'll just do AI and all of our problems go away. It's just not that simple. But the fact is that if you aren't looking hard at it, you're either going to get left behind or you're going to, your competition will figure it out or you're going to get hit run over at some point. Ron, if I could add something, and this is from my own opinion, is... I was at Manifest in Vegas in February, and I was having conversations with people from Ryder 
and green screens in particular. And we talked a lot about this whole idea of AI readiness because we don't say this very much, but we used to say it all the time. We say garbage in, garbage out. Nothing could be more true <laughs> about garbage in, garbage out. So if somebody says, oh, I've got this fantastic AI solution, the first thing they're going to say to you is, we need to get your data cleaned up. And I used to say this, the problem many of us have is dirty data. And it also has to be normalized. So if you think about little things like different currencies or different timestamps, so also like dates. So I can collect a whole bunch of dates. And here in the United States, we say today is 5-24-2024. But somebody else would say, no, it's 24 <laughs> 5 24. And so the Europeans look at it a little different and we have that all the time. And when you're working in a global supply chain and almost all of them feel that way, normalizing the data is a huge problem before you. So, so AI is only going to basically highlight where you are weak. So it's almost, it's not garbage in, garbage out. I feel like it's garbage in, garbage squared because I'm making decisions based on bad data. And it's not AI's fault that you didn't have good data. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And getting back to that quick little story here about most like 30 different things for supply chain at the time, you said artificial intelligence and the application of artificial intelligence in the context of operating supply chain was a mandate, right? Something organizations had to be looking at. We got to solve the data problems. We had additive manufacturing. Think about 3D printing and some other technologies that are going along. Internet of Things came in there, edge sensor technologies, providing data all the way across the supply chain, right? supplying information or down down, signal what's going on out there. Autonomous supply chain technologies like automation of procurement. One of our partners specializes in automating procurement processes for reverse markets. Autonomous planning of inventory across the multiple nodes, those sorts of things. Cloud computing, certainly big hits, but then it goes on, right? So that was just like the one we for the purposes of a mapping courseware, right? You said these are the ones that really most of that supply chain, but it goes way beyond that. You've got the big data thing you talked about. There's cybersecurity. We were talking about that before we started the recording. Yes, and biggie. And it freight fraud's been a big there's an immense <laughs> problem around cybersecurity. You talked about it in the freight side of things uh, earlier. Uh, but it goes way beyond that, right? What's going on with my suppliers and what they're developing for products that are going to get my stuff and what's the cybersecurity risk I'm taking down there? Downstream suppliers helping fulfillment and service. What are all my risks out there? And what am I opening myself up to from a mobility perspective? It's just the list goes on and on. It's just crazy, right? So cybersecurity is huge. We have enterprise risk, enterprise information management strategies, supply chain community has to be engaged with that. That's a bit because thrown over to IT, but you no, know, it's really an enterprise problem. You know, it's a practical matter. Most supply chain organizations, you know, particularly in tangible goods firms, they've got that line of sight upward and downward through the value stream, all the way from product development, getting suppliers involved in developing new products and services we're going to burn, the execution of that, and then the fulfillment and service of that for the end of life cycle and reverse supply chain. That information has got to have centralized and good management practices. So good EIM practices, enterprise information management, is a big chunk of this, I'll call it digitization, mastery of that, robotic process automation, warehousing. is a great example of how that's coming more quickly. Amazon being a great example of that. Leveraging machine learning and the related tools, right, ties back into AI and big data management. Uh, technology, oh, ESG. This came up as an actual topic in uh, one of my podcasts. We had a panelist come in and just talk about the environmental, the social, and the governance aspects that are impacting us from a technology perspective and how we get things done. So this whole thing around uh, social responsibility is turning into a big IT problem because what we lack is the information to feed good ESG practices. Organizations have to become much more adapted. If you are looking for a TMS, please consider my friends at Revenova. Revenova is a cloud-based transportation management system built on the Salesforce platform, which means it has a built-in CRM and a higher level of security, reliability, and performance. 
Revanova is used by many of the top 3PLs, brokers, carriers, and shippers because it has all the features. It's multimodal, and it comes with lots of premium features like predictive pricing. If you want to learn more, please visit Revanova.com. That's R-E-V-E-N-O-V-A.com. Or check the show notes for a link to my interview with Mike Horbath, one of the founders of Revanova. So, Ron, it's interesting, ESG, and sometimes you hear somebody throw ESG and DEI in, in together. And now you look and hear people say, oh, that's got all of a sudden become political. I think we have to make some judgments on, on some of this stuff. With, so I think we're still going to hire based on merit. We still want... We want to be good corporate citizens. We're going to have sustainability. But I think this is the from kind of my podcast and I, in business in general, I never want anything that's political. But in that, it's funny because people have stepped in it on, on some of this. And you have to have a plan. And I think what's happened in some cases is people just go, oh, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that without really a serious thought about the implications to the organization. And also, we're not in a world anymore where corporate actions can be hidden because all the employees are posting on LinkedIn. People know things about your company. Pre-internet, you could do things and no one knew. Not anymore. So if you're not being a good corporate citizen, whatever that means to your company, whatever that means to your customers, it's going to be all out there. So do the right thing. <laughs> exactly. And but organizations are going to find themselves under a lot more pressure to understand what their suppliers are doing. Just like basic human rights, right? And the garment industry was the our lady that gave the was the panelist that I interviewed. The garment industry is one of the, the leaders in understanding from an enterprise perspective, what about child labor and all these sort of safety of the workforce in these third world countries that they're outsourcing to. You have social responsibility for that. And if it's not been mandated, it will. Ron, you and I both have a lot of experience in the automotive supply chain, which is the biggest, baddest supply chain on earth. So the tier ones are all well-known companies, Denso, Magna, all they're, they work with everybody. The Germans, they work with the Koreans, they work with the Japanese, Americans, everybody. We all know those companies. But then there's the tier twos. The tier twos are often very big companies, billion dollar companies that are publicly traded. Then there's tier threes. And you go, a little less knowledge about what's going on with the tier three. And then there's a tier four. And some of those are just, I'm buying MRO, right? I'm buying maintenance, repair operations kind of thing. And maybe I'm buying rags from that company, maybe some oil or something that is a commodity. But we don't have good visibility into those. And here's the thing. If I'm working with a BMW or a General Motors or a Toyota, they're going to say, Ron, Joe, make sure you're not going to do anything that compromises our good name. And that's the challenge. That's three, four layers away from me. And it could be a country away. I do know that the U.S. government now says you can't buy from certain regions in China that might be using slave labor. How are you going to figure that out? It's going to be with technology. And we're going to have to make those investments because the last thing you want is to say, we don't have that technology. And now all of a sudden, the whole world thinks poorly of us because of blank. I won't mention the names because it's not appropriate, but I have two daughters who say, all the time to me. I don't like that company because of blank. And it's usually something human rights related on the other side of the planet or pollution related. It's <laughs> These are problems that can sink your business. <laughs> exactly. So let me wrap up with uh, a couple more things on technology here. So just to finish up there, right? So ESG, that launched the whole discussion there. Intelligent process automation tools, there's modeling simulation. What's interesting is under the Defense Production Act, which was kicked up by the administration last year, one of the big initiatives is creating epicenters for modeling and simulation supply chain to protect North American supply chains and critical supply for not only defense, but also things like medicine and food and things like that. And then there's unified collaboration tools. I'm just scratching the surface here. So there's two important things here I want to 
wrap up this part around digitization and automation of work and supply chain is a massive common problem every organization faces. But two things about that. One, it's death by a thousand cuts. There's no silver bullets. So, you know, I did an entire podcast with Sanjay Kahunger, which you can watch. And he's like crazy smart guy around digital transformation. And he was one of the people I pulled in to help me with developing those online programs, of digital transformation awareness, which, oh, by the way, a customer earned Gartner Magic Quadrant worldwide for the quality nice. of the digital transformation awareness training. So I was pretty happy that we had the contribution to that. But Sanjay shared a whole bunch of really cool deep dives to three key areas within digital transformation, within supply chain, that breaks it down into some depth and granularity for those who want to understand some of the technical widgets of that. But, it, but I'll tell you right up front, it's death by a thousand cuts. If you're not able to measure the processes, if you're not able to map, the value stream mapping would be a common mean six the tool. The great deming is, right? If you can't describe what you're doing this process, you don't know what you're doing, right? From towards deming, from a quality perspective, if you can't measure it and put a metric to that and understand it, you don't know what you're doing. So the trick with digital transformation, you've got to map the processes deeply enough, understand of the hundred things we could do, which 10 will move the needle now? And then you pick very carefully the strategic elements of, I'll call it digital transformation at all, that are going to help you move the needle. But recognize you've got 30, 60, 90 days max to get that done. Why would I say that? Because the only constant is, starts with a C, change. All right, so the assumptions and everything we built on, that we want to deploy technologies there, change so rapidly. If you can't turn the loop and close that and start to harvest the fruit of that very quickly, why are you doing it? Because all of your assumptions may be in dollar in 120 days time. So it is a 5,000 cuts. There's no silver bullet. We got very strategic and surgical. And, but you've got to know why you're attacking it, how you're going to measure it, and you need to validate and control for the results you're looking for. If you're going to look toward Digital transformation. Yep. And that digital transformation is last in the logistics and supply chain space because it's the hardest. Supply chains stretch across the planet. Ron and I are old enough to remember pre-internet days when we first started using intranets and intranets, like just within the companies. It was easy relative to today. It was easy to wire within our four walls. But when you had to all of a sudden say, hey, there's locations around the world and trucking companies and shipping companies and freight brokerages and everybody else in between all has to be wired, it's a, the task is much um, taller. So anyway, we talked a little bit about digital digitization and automation, including AI. The next thing on the list, Ron, is the forever, I love your term here, forever labor shortage. Please elaborate. Okay, I didn't make that up. They've gone on the internet and just Google the words forever and labor shortage. And a particularly great example was published here. Let me get this right. It was here by uh, the data came from the Congressional Budget Office, but it came from the Business Insider. And this little chart tells a story. Yeah, please read those for people who are listening to the podcast. Most are listening. So read some of those. Yeah, so imagine you've got this chart that's showing by decade for those who can't see it. So they charted the percentage of growth for the North American workforce. This is U.S. Uh, workforce. The way the chart reads, as boomers retire, the workforce growth will plunge for decades. So they actually had, for the last decade of the 2000s, there was just shy of 12% of the entire workforce entered the workforce during that decade. Okay. So if our workforce was 300,000, we had about 65,000. I'm sorry, 300,000. 300 million, we had about 65 million, right? Just do the math, about 12%. But well, then in the first decade of the 2000s, that dropped to under 8%. So it went from nearly 12 to 8, under 8. And then the most recent decade, 2012 through 2021, it dropped to 5%, less than half what it was just two decades before. The forecast for a current decade ending in 2020, 31 is less than 4%, and it gets worse the further you go. And then that 4% refers to what? Total percentage of new people entering the workforce. Okay, okay. So you're right. Boomers are retiring, right? Birth rates are down. Yeah. Immigration is down. So the number of people entering the workforce 
in North America, the United States, and most Western countries, for that matter, is not getting bigger. It's actually getting smaller. It's interesting because if you look at the demographic crisis, Brian, we, you and I grew up hearing about the population boom. So while we've been alive, the population of the planet has doubled, more than doubled. And there was always concern when we were young <laughs> that we were going to grow so fast we'd outgrow this planet. And now the birth rates are so slow in China is right now, from what I understand, Peter Zion talks about this quite a bit on his podcast, uh, is it's the fastest aging country in history. And there was really two reasons. I think they had the one child policy. That was part of it. But also when people move from rural to urban, they have fewer children. It's well, that's still true in the United States. There's more kids in the suburbs and in the rural areas than there are in the cities because it's more expensive to have kids in the city. But getting back to it, here in the United States, we have fewer and fewer people coming into the workforce. And I would say <laughs> every generation expects a little more than their parents' generation. So they're pretty well educated and they have high expectations. Now, how are we going to get those people not only to do the difficult technical jobs, but also the jobs at the warehouses, at the docks, at the factories? It's going to get harder and harder. And I believe, and I want to get your two cents on this, Ron, I think we have to start looking at those jobs differently and say, hey, this is the first step in a warehouse. This first job in a warehouse, we're going to be using technologies that help you do more with less, but also it's a first step in a supply chain career, not a dead end job where you walk around with heavy stuff in your arms all day. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. I have to agree with that. So the point I wanted to get at here around this forever labor shortage is that really perpetuates those three things, right? When I talk about one of the common three challenges supply chains have, and just come right back to it, what do you do about that? And it ties into got to do more with less, but we're just going to talk about people, right? So there's three things that, that every organization should be doing to combat this forever labor shortage problem. And the first one is if you aren't an adopter and a good practice, or I'll call it lean signal or lean techniques, where we're just cautious about looking at processes, understanding what people are doing, and getting rid of the activities that don't have value and free up people to do stuff they actually would enjoy doing versus crazy stuff like fixing stuff that's broke. What do we keep, do to keep them from getting broken in the first place? You know, how we look at processes for, okay, what could be automated? Now, like getting back to that death by a thousand cuts on digital transformation, not mapping the processes, understanding what activities are consuming people's time, and critically looking at what could practically be automated, take the things away from people they really don't want to do anyway, in anyway, many cases, or should it be doing because it shouldn't even happen. And getting rid of that should be a high priority, right? So good lean techniques, yes. just basic waste elimination, shame on us if we're not well down the road and really working hard to build that into the culture of an organization, right? The second thing, digitization, right? Automation. We should not be overlooking any opportunities to digitize and reduce the reliance on human uh, people. And then the third one, which we're going to do a podcast on this specifically at some point is what do you do to become the employer of choice? So if you happen to have a war on talent or a war for talent, what are you doing as an organization? And by the way, this is not a next week fix it kind of thing. This is a multi-year strategic initiative, big push out there that the chief human relations officer, CRO, or whatever your label that is, that seat has typically been tucked in or able to see file or whatever under operations, but that's going to be a seat at the table as a strategic initiative for the future success of our organization. If we take one step further, you've got to develop a workforce of supply chain. Remember this topic, this webinar, or this uh, podcast is supply chain 2030. Right here, we've got to stop and talk about developing the workforce of the future for supply chain. It's a huge shortage of supply chain expertise out there. It's getting worse. And not only for us and our own companies, but all of our suppliers upstream and what we are we talking to them? What are they doing, you know, in front of their labor shortages? And what are we doing to help our customers downstream of us deal with their labor shortages? So we have a right. responsibility in the supply chain organization 
perpetuate this whole notion of doing, you know, what are we doing to develop the workforce of the future and be able to get a lot more done with the same people we have. Okay. Which gives us that, that third thing is you've all got to do more with less. That's not going to go away, but that's less facilities, right? Less travel time. Okay. Wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't be shipping stuff 2000 across the ocean. Maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe it makes sense financially, but does it make sense in the bigger picture of social responsibility, being able to turn things quickly, obsolescence. You know, we were sharing a story with me recently about containers on its way over here and suddenly there's a design change. So now we get to throw it away because of the problem. Yeah, I I did that. I, I remember it was a month on the ocean and and I sent the <laughs> I made the phone call and said, Hey, the first two containers just they're scrap. Like we built them and then scrapped them while it was on the ocean. And they said, Oh, we'll rework it. I said, Nope, don't rework it. Scrap. It's a as a Ron, I as you were talking, it hit me. I was talking to a young procurement person not so long ago. And she said, Oh my God, every day I, she was working at one of the vaccine companies. She says, Every day I get hundreds of requests for things I need to buy. It was PPE. It was all the stuff that uh, you would need to keep a vaccine facility open. And I said, are these orders just emails? And she said, yeah. I said, well, what are they asking? She said, they're usually the same stuff. And I said, your company should be using some sort of robotic process automation. So you're not manually entering these into a system. They should be all entered into your system. She said, yeah, but I have to check them. I said, I get you have to check them, but if they were they could be first off put directly into your system for you to review and approve or whoever has to approve it. But freight brokers will, will say any freight broker will tell you this. They receive hundreds of emails per day saying, I need a price for this from here to here. And a lot of them are just, and by the way, there's a, the transportation management system. People are saying, yeah, you can put that right in the system. You do have customers who don't want to do that. But if you have those, there's no reason you can't use a bot, robotic process automation, to put them into your system. And by the way, you can go one step further with IPA. And it's not beer, guys. It's, it's uh, IPA stands for what? What's the I stand for? It's intelligent process. Intelligent automation. process automation. It's IPA. Not India Pale Ale, but intelligent process automation. So that would say, that could get to the point where it's actually saying that price is this and it sends it out on your behalf, or maybe you get to an approval process. But I guess my point is nobody likes the idea of being a clerk and putting 200, 200 entries into a system. If we can get them out of the clerk work, and that's exactly what you said, doing higher level work. We're not talking about laying people off. We're talking about moving people up in the food chain and letting technology do what technology does. Exactly. And I want to finish up on you know, this whole notion of being the employer of choice and developing supply chain talent for the future. And I had some fun not too long ago, or not just last month, I think, I was a guest speaker as a professional development dinner meeting, but it was all virtual, right? For one of the ASCM, it used to be APEX, American Production Detroit Control Society, now Association for Supply Management. And uh, one of their chapters reached out to me and asked me if I would facilitate a virtual online meeting. The topic was supply chain in 2030. And uh, so I had some fun with your audience, right? Uh, uh, just to talk about being the employer of choice. And we're going to be selfish here and think about supply chain votes. And I had a list of all the things that you could Google about what do you do to become the supplier of the, the employer of choice? Hey, virtual work, flexible work schedule, blah, blah, blah. And I was pleasantly surprised that the number one thing that people picked from that list, this was a supply chain group, is feeling like the work you do is meaningful and makes a difference. Yes. It was the number one choice. It wasn't pay. It wasn't working from home. Yeah, Ron, I've said this before. I remember having to, I wasn't part of this organization, but I was a, one of the big three automakers. I was an outsider, but I was working with one of their teams. So they said, please fill this out. It was for our culture, blah, blah, blah. And and I remember it, it was one of those things, and you've been through it, all of us who have been through it, where they were trying to, we're trying to raise morale. And people were talking about, well, maybe we should have Hawaiian shirt day. And maybe we should do game night where we all go to Dave and Buster's and play games after work. And, and I remember I said, no, I'm not a child. I'm not, 
I don't want to wear a stupid Hawaiian shirt. If I want to wear one, I want to wear one. But if I don't feel like I don't want to wear that. And that's not going to make me feel good about my job. It makes me feel like a fool that I that this somehow made me happy that we're all dressed up, right? It's like Halloween. <laughs> and I said, all I want from this is I want to work with a great group of people on a big challenge. And then I want us to celebrate selected milestones, not fake celebrations, not, oh my God, Joe, it's so great that you came in three days in a row. <laughs> I want to celebrate when we did something that we didn't think could be done. Exactly. So I'm going to get into kind of that third thing everybody's got to be doing. That's just doing more or less. Lean manufacturing, you can think about that. Certainly digitization is a piece of that, but it goes beyond that. Here's a longer term. One of our podcasts coming up pretty quick, uh, a couple of folks that we interviewed with that are going to talk things to talk through. How do we really sit down as an organization and think about sourcing, right? For example, I was talking with a VP of supply chain for a startup company making EV battery systems. And this is a startup getting this all off the ground. He said, look, he says, one of my goals, I'd love to get Jason on. Maybe I can in the future when he has time. But one of my goals is to source 50% of everything I buy, I want supplied within 50 miles of my assembly line. Yep. 50% of my spend, I want it to be supplied within 50 miles of my location. This is for this battery systems. And that's a big ask when you think about where the global sourcing footprint is for all of us. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. And so there are specific things organizations have to work through. If I need to be able to do it with less inventory, I can't have stuff spending months on ships, right? Got to look at nearshoring or reshoring. Right. Got to look at creative ways to come up with that supply. I need to be looking hard at my product development side. You know, developing support, you're developing suppliers and a supply chain that can actually be nearby and very responsive to what I need. And you mentioned it, the you automotive know, supply chain was pretty advanced in that, but everybody else needs to catch up. We're really careful in working through as a practical matter how you can do that. So there's more doing more with less facilities. You figure out how to automate, so you can do a lot more with automation. You don't need space for people now. You can do it with less space. Less, uh, fewer hours, right? And fewer man hours required to produce a, a unit of value. That's less. Less is better, right? Fewer miles traveled for that. I remember doing some crazy math where we would try to understand how many miles this pound of steel tra traveled before it ended up in the consumer's hand in the finished product. It's like, you got to be kidding, crazy. By the way, Ron, I did a podcast a few years ago with Jason Miller. He's a professor at university or Michigan State University. And we talked about the frying pan skillet. So a hundred years ago, the skillet would have been made in Wisconsin. Almost all of them were. And if to get to Kalamazoo or Detroit, it would have come by train. That the raw materials, the metals, they came from the Upper Peninsula or Minnesota. And then they went to Gary, Indiana by boat. And then today's skillet comes from China. And the, and the raw materials comes from Australia. What's happening is we're starting to see a trickle of that skillet manufacturing come back. But here's the difference. It used to be 100 people in a factory. Now it's very few people. And by the way, you can go on google skillet manufacturing it's highly automated so we moved a ton of stuff first off it moved i'll use, use the skillet example it moved from wisconsin as wisconsin became uh, labor became expensive and unionized it moved down to mississippi and alabama labor arbitrage then it went from down south to asia again labor arbitrage but if it's automated then the labor it no longer is the primary thing we worry about. It go bang. You know? Yeah. And the, while labor, while we were ignoring the environmental impact of ships and trucks moving across the world, now we're more concerned with that. And automation doesn't care if it lives in China <laughs> or in the US. So as things become automated, the equation changes. And I really, right now, Mexican labor is less expensive than China labor. For a long time, it was different. But I think when we talk about automation, it, it, Ron, when you, what, one thing you're very good at is fresh eyes. You bring fresh eyes to problems. You and your people, 
you show up and go, why are we doing it that way? And a lot of times, well, it, if I answer, the people in China are cheaper, they used to be, right? And by the way, if you flew to China, uh, nice trip. <laughs> Once you get there, you love it. You're going to find out they automated it a long time ago. So the, the, the cheap labor didn't matter very much. World's changing. All too true. All too true. Ron, I'm, one other thing I'm going to say one more time, and it'll be a little salesy for you, okay. is I really do feel like we also, we need to question the 40-hour work week. You, you talked about how people, less people entering the workforce. We're going to need some baby boomers to stick around longer. And you're not going to be able to lean on them the way you did when they were 40 years old. You can, if you got a guy or a gal who's 70 and says, I am willing to come in and lend my expertise, but I want to do it. I want the summers off or I want to leave. I, I'm not going to be in on Fridays or I'm going to work remote. That's where companies like yours plug in really nicely to bring in interim interim talent. Also, I say expertise that can develop direction where some of the overseas talent that we're hiring, they're going to get better and better. We're going to be able to lean on them more and more. But in the interim, in the next five years, while that talent's developing, we need somebody to set direction in whatever area that is. So if you get some guy who says, I retired from Ford and I have 35 years of procurement in a really aggressive manufacturing environment, that's the guy I want setting direction. I don't want to say, oh, I, yeah, I outsourced it to Columbia, a, a very sharp young man who's never bought for manufacturing yet. Yep, exactly. And that's the beauty. That's the beauty of the interim talent model, particularly if you're open to tapping your bell call the aging workforce, you're willing to bend how you work, and maybe work not only one full time resources, two or even three individuals who are sharing that work. That all becomes very doable. Yeah, we also learned during COVID, we had a lot of people rethink their priorities and say, you know what? I want to be in my house. I, I want to raise my kids. I want to do things a little differently. As the world becomes wealthier, I think some people are going to say, I want a four-hour work week, or I want to work really hard for six months and be gone for six months and see you next year. Anyway, Ron, I'm going to summarize all these things we talked about. Then I want to get your final thoughts on the topic. I'm talking to my friend, Ron Crabtree about supply chain 2030. We talked about three big trends that are happening in supply chain. Number one is this digitization automation. Anyone who listens to my podcast knows that's a very common theme. AI is going to be a big tool for our future, but right now it is not quite the silver bullet that we all want it to be, but you have to start getting ready. I think AI readiness is where we, a lot of us are clean up your data, normalize your data so it can actually be plugged into a model at some point. Then we talked about this forever labor shortage. And that is true, not only in supply chain, but also in the trucking space. We, we never don't have a trucking problem, a trucker problem, a shortage of truckers. So we have to look at brand new solutions for all these problems. And then this whole idea of doing more with less, of course. <laughs> and we talked about that. Uh, Ron, Final thoughts, put a big old bow on this one. I'll just suggest that we're tackling that here. It's part of our objective to be thought leaders in the space of what organizations can and should be doing, how to go about dealing with these realities that we have to deal with. That's what the Metapod podcast series is. We put together and got it launched in, in April. We started with the Department of the Defense Production Act and helping organizations understand what's going on to can tap into here in North America. And then we're expanding into how do you develop and use in our account? How can you tap into that for operations, sales, finance, areas like that? And as we move into the future of months this year, we're getting into deeper dive topics like that whole strategy thing around where am I sourcing? Why am I sourcing? How can I figure out how to get that sourcing closer in? And why would I choose to do that? And then how do I actually build the business case? measure and control, right, for better results. So we're going to get deeper and deeper. And uh, so it's experts. Uh, if you go to metaexperts.com and then the URL, have that written down here somewhere. If I get that pulled back up here to my consciousness. Yeah, so it would be Metapod. So it's metaexperts.com forward slash Metapod. And uh, I would 
approach that. I'll put in the show notes. Yeah, if people tap into that, we've got it available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Ask people to be sure to like that. Be happy. Very appreciative of folks there. Want to check that out? If you'd be happy to share that out and shout that out to others, and you know, to improve the the listenership. We think that by pulling in people like Joe, in fact, I have Joe on my target list. For somebody pulling in as one of our podcast uh, interviewees. We're going to take can't wait. dives into the micro elements of how to tackle some of these challenges one level deeper in much more specific buttons. Yep. I love it, Ron. What I'll do is I'll make sure I put a link to your LinkedIn profile, a link to your website, a link to Meta Pod series. And I know you always have lots of white papers and stuff. So anything you have that or any other videos that are that you want to pump out, we'll put those in the show notes so people can reach out and talk to you. So if somebody's listening and they say, Ron, we need some help. And by the way, guys, even if you don't need the help right now, I'm a big believer that you partner up. <laughs> you get, you have a technology partner, you have an outsourcing partner, BPO, whatever you want to call it. You have carrier partners. I believe you need a partner like Ron who can bring you inter- interim talent. I think you need to, to make those connections before you have the problem. So if somebody's listening and says, yeah, Ron, I want to talk to you. Well, how does it start when you start talking to customers? What, what's the process? Well, there's multiple pieces. So you can go to metaexperts.com. There's a button there for find a meta expert. If you want to take a look at talent to solve a particular problem you have, there's a place to register there, give us your contact information. That'll end up in my hands or my team's hands. You can always give me a call. And my office line is 734-425-1455. I'm on extension 103, and the secret to that is it actually connects to my cell phone, right? So most people's cell phones nowadays screen out people they don't recognize the number. That bypasses the problem, right? So 734-425-1455, I'm extension 103, and it tracks me down anywhere in the world. So what's the process look like once they talk to you? What's the process for uh, you helping them? Let's just pretend that they've got the challenge and they need help, right? So we have a 47-point customer alignment worksheet process we go through to really carefully define what's the situation we're up against, what would a good outcome look like, and ask lots of questions to understand what it is that we're solving for. So we don't waste time presenting candidates that aren't a fit or not in your budget or anything like that. So that's a process that my team was very finely tuned to develop was leading our customers through a careful description of what good is because sometimes that's half the problem is you've got this burning platform, but we need a little help diagnosing what's the right thing to do. And sometimes even that's the first engagement. We just need somebody to stick their nose on this. Then they have done that and solved that problem just for a few hours or a few days, help us sort it. Ron, that's what I ended up doing with you. It, it was it was an 80-hour project over one month. And I remember, actually, I remember the day, Ron, it was election day 2016. We traveled to the client. We worked all day till 10, 11 o'clock at night. And then the next morning when we had a new president, I was a surprise that it was Trump. And I remember I was so busy that day. And I was like, and I kept looking up at the TV. I was in the lobby. And I go, God, there's an awful lot of Trump on TV. I assume he didn't win. And then you said, that's because he's the new president. I was like, what? (laughs) So I always remember that day, but we spent a lot of time just with that assessment. And I thought that was the end of it. Maybe you did too. But they really liked what we discovered in that 80 hours and said, we have a bigger problem. Help us. (laughs) Correct. Anyway, Ron, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I always love what you guys are doing and I've loved working with you in the past. So I'll make anyone who's looking for a a gig, you should talk to Ron. He's got some cool projects. Of course, you have to be qualified for them. Exactly. We're always looking for thought leadership. People would like to be a guest in my podcast and always looking for folks that have great ideas. If they have a hack or something they've done successfully, they'd like to share that with the world and always looking for folks with great content. We're always looking to add more meta experts to our community who uh, can be experts we can pull through to help our customers with their problems. And of course, never have enough customers. <laughs> yes, exactly. Ron, thank you so much for taking the time. I love what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward.
You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.